Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to Become Famous Podcast. I'm really excited to have Zanti Ho. She was here before when the podcast called Moving Beyond Your Tribe. And she's now the managing director of Convince and Convert. But more importantly, and what's really exciting is she's written a book that's very timely. It's the Data Driven Personalization. And welcome. Thanks, Torn. I'm so happy to be here and always enjoy a chat with you. Yeah. So tell us, you um, took the time, you know, I just wrote a book, so I don't know how you felt, but you're kind of juggling. And not only that, you're a mother to a beautiful daughter. How old is she now? Two years old? Um, 18 months. 18 months. Wow. Yeah. And so how did you juggle that? And you came to this realization about data-driven personalization, which I think is so timely. Um, Both great questions. Um, I think that I tell people that I love being busy when I'm passionate about projects. I find time for them. And I'm also a person who uh, doesn't do well with idle hands. So I think that the more projects that I have, the more productive I am in my life, to be very frank. So it happened to be that my publisher reached out to me around the time that I had just come back from maternity leave. So I was probably three or four months postpartum, and they said to me, hey, do you want to write a book? And if so, what would that book be about? And I said, hey, in fact, I've been working on an outline for a little while, about a year at that point, of some ideas. And I think that there's something here that I want to say about the importance of data and insights for the marketing community that right now, I believe that marketers need to have a seat at the data table in order to truly get the most out of the data and insights that we have available. Every one of our organizations is collecting more information about our audiences than ever before. We have the ability to do so, right? Because there are so many digital touch points. And quite frankly, all of us have a smartphone in our pockets. When you walk around, you are essentially shedding data everywhere you go. You scan a QR code, you interact with an advertisement, you download something. Every place you go, you are interacting with brands. The truth is, as much as we talk about data privacy and how they're tracking you everywhere, most organizations are not that sophisticated. In fact, as a marketer, what I see is the flip side of that, which is that most marketing organizations, the marketers, the customer service people, the sales people, the product people, the people who actually interface with the customers are actually not the ones who are most involved in the shaping and collecting of that data. And therefore, they don't have a stake in how to truly make it valuable for the organization. So when I was thinking about what do I want to write about, it was really this idea of how do we make sure that marketers can deliver on this high expectation that customers have around the customer experience, which is that we all want it to be more seamless, more relevant, more helpful but do it in such a way that makes sense for our customers because we have access to the right data. And we can't have access to the right data if we're not collecting the right data. And so that's really why I wrote this book and what the book is really about. I'm kind of surprised because I come more from a communication standpoint. I've always worked like more on the PR phase. And I've always had the impression that marketeers are very data driven, like just utilizing words that we in PR used, content marketing, like really finding sure. ways to make money, make more views, followers. And I, I'm so surprised that you're saying that they're not good. I've always looked at them as being at the seat, seat of the table and being the ones that really have the data points. So I am really uh, would love for you to expand on that a little bit. Absolutely. I think that there is a difference between metrics driven and data and insights driven, right? Most marketers have the ability to tell you what are our metrics. But the question, and I think the need is to deliver on the customer's expectations of a more seamless and integrated experience. And that requires collecting the dots. So instead of saying, this is how we are effective in social media, this is how we are effective in email, this is how we are effective on our website or through video. What I want marketers to think about is how do we make sure that we're 
actually reaching the right customer throughout their customer journey, throughout all of the different points that they experience from a marketing and communications experience. And how do we actually make sure that we're giving them the right things at the right times to be relevant? And how do we nurture a better, more high quality audience because we're doing the delivery of the right things at the right time? So I'll give you an example that we've probably all experienced. You go online, you purchase something that you need. Let's say it's a pair of shoes. The next time you go on your favorite social media platform, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever, you get an advertisement from that company for that exact pair of shoes that you just purchased. Not only is that a waste of money from a marketing standpoint, right? Because they're advertising to someone who literally just bought that product. But for you, the customer, it's actually an unsatisfying experience because you think to yourself, if I literally just bought this and you don't know that about me, how little do you know about what is important to me? And so that erodes trust. In the ideal situation, a customer would feel like a company is actually anticipating their needs and providing with them with the resources they need for the next thing and making them feel cared for in those ways. And so that's one of those examples of an experience that we have every day where I think that marketers are doing a limited amount of things. They they recognize, hey, somebody interacted with our website, we should retarget them. But are they doing it in the smartest way? And they can't if they're not collecting the right information at the right places, right? This is a, an issue of um, being strategic and integrated across our different touch points. Um, one of the examples I share in the book is of the um, company Fresh Direct. They are a, a direct-to-consumer grocery company in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area. And what they have actually been very smart about is that their website, their app, their SMS, their email is extremely integrated. And so they can really tell, no matter where you're shopping across their environment, what are the things that you purchase on a regular basis and what are your patterns? So if they notice at the beginning of the month, I like to load up on breakfast items, they're not going to show me burgers and hot dogs because it's the wrong offering at that time of the month. They're going to be responsive. But also they might see, I purchase a lot of Chobani yogurt and therefore they would offer me ancillary products that are related. Maybe if Chobani rolls out a new product and I think, oh, this is perfect for my daughter. They are showing it to me preemptively because they know that this is something that I need. The idea, I think, of data-driven personalization is to say, how could we better serve our audience at the times and places that are relevant with them for them with the items or recommendations that help them get the most out of their relationship with us. And that applies for both B2B and B2C. We experience this across the board, right? We're all so busy. We're so inundated with information. If we had brands that were doing a better job of saving us time by giving us the right information, I think that we would actually be more excited to work with those brands versus others. Oh, wow. I, I totally get it. You're so right. Because I had this one uh, company that I was signing up for. And I know that they use HubSpot because you can sometimes see on their website, they've got HubSpot. And the guys are calling me and I say, well, have you looked me up on website on um, HubSpot? Do you know who I am? And he goes, you have HubSpot. Why have you not taken notes? And I was challenging him. And he was because I love challenging these people sometimes. And I'm so frustrated. You're absolutely right. Where they are not reading what they have of you of information that you know that they have, because I know I talked to the, the owner, he has HubSpot and I'm like, why are you guys not using? And I actually informed them you're not using HubSpot appropriately. It's not just about taking in and calling and making the sale, but how do you meet me in my journey? And if you met me in my journey, I would be a better client. So you're absolutely right. And how do you, how do you do this? At least in Europe, you have the GDPR. How can you utilize that? And how, how does that really work? Or it's Great really question. not a problem because you're not really pushing out information towards them. You're really interacting with the mess, but I'd love for you to touch that because a lot of my listeners are from Europe. Absolutely. And um, I certainly touch upon not only GDPR, but regulations and these kinds of considerations in the book as well, because, of course, that's something that we have to consider not only the legal implications, but the ethical implications. What I talk about in the book is really how do we build an environment 
that is inside the brand that people want to interact with, right? Because GDPR is very much about how do we share that data out and how do we collect that data and hold on to that data. What's important is to make sure that you are using the data in a highly relevant way for that customer, right? So we're not collecting data willy-nilly. If I'm a company that's selling shoes, it is not necessary for me to collect information about your children, for instance, right? Because it may not be relevant to the things that I'm actually selling you. But if I'm selling shoes, I want to know about your lifestyle. Do you live in an urban environment? Are you a country person? Do you uh, use shoes for exercise? Are you using them for work, right? Those are the kinds of things that I might ask you. So I think it's about building a highly relevant data set, first of all, because that's important. And second of all, how do you build that environment with in the brand itself. So in the book, I share the example of Nike, who is doing a fantastic job of creating an environment for their different uh, audiences. For instance, you have the Nike Run app, right, which is for people who are hardcore runners or just weekend warriors. They have a sneakerhead app. They also have a separate exercise app that has a wide variety of different cross-training uh, experiences. Now, of course, for the customer, it's a value add, right? They are getting free exercise programming or free information about sneakers from Nike that helps them live a better life. But Nike is also within this environment able to see what does this person prioritize, right? So without asking you, um, do you run on weekends? Who do you run with? What kinds of distances are you doing? They can actually see that in their own data. And therefore, they are actually making recommendations. When you hit a certain number of miles within the Nike Run app, they will say to you, hey, it's probably time to replace your sneakers. And based on the different sneakers that you've purchased in the past, this is probably what we would recommend. For those people who are on the Sneakerhead app, they are letting these people know when products drop that are highly relevant to them that are the kind of thing that they collect or that they are particularly interested in purchasing, right? So based on those behaviors and signals and information that the the customer is providing for their own benefit, because that's information that helps them live a better life, Nike is actually able to learn a lot about them. And so what I'm encouraging uh, businesses to think about is what is that extended environment in which we can collect data that, again, gives the customer a better experience? To your point about a B2B environment where they're running HubSpot, an opportunity is to say, let's send our customers email automations where we're asking them what are the most relevant topics for them. And based on those those choices that they make, you know, they three they send three different topics and you say, I like option A the best. That's the most relevant to me. That would help me live a better life in my work. Then they are sending you more content based on that and then iterating and changing the content based on your personal selections over time. That can be done from a technology point of view, but it's giving you, the audience, a better experience, and it's giving the that company more relevant information so that when you get a call from them, they can say, hey, I know that a topic is the one that is most interesting to you. Tell me a little bit more about that, right? They can start a conversation warm because they have more of that history with you. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for companies to be more creative. The other example that I share in the book that I think is a, is a fun one is from Sephora, which is, of course, a chain of um, beauty and makeup stores. One thing that they observed in their stores was that people were actually pulling out their smartphones or their notes to check the colors that they had previously purchased. Because I think if you are a woman who likes to wear makeup or a man who likes to wear makeup, one of the things you know is you have certain colors that match your skin tone or that you prefer. And sometimes when you're in a store, you don't remember the exact specification number, right? So they noticed that people were already pulling out their phones to check that information with our notebooks. And so they decided, let's build an app where we're actually helping you to more easily capture that information and store that information so that the next time you're in our store, you can pull it out and it already has your entire color palette or it can make you recommendations for related products that are very similar shades. And so that improves your experience as a customer, but it gives Sephora more information about your purchase behaviors so they can give you a better experience and they can deliver more relevant marketing to you. You know, it's interesting when you're saying all of this, it seems to me, and that's why I talk about my book about a revolution. We're really in a revolution where everything is changing because um, the budget for, an offering is not just the offering anymore. 
It is like you have to add to the offering an extended experience, personal driven towards the client. And I think maybe that's a real, with your book, it's really a mind shift for companies to realize that to really make it in this industry right now is to be like Fresh Direct, to be like Nike. And even if you are small, how can you create that kind of experience? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And in fact, I share a couple of examples from small businesses within the book, because I think, again, this is something that's achievable at all different sizes. One of the examples that I share in the book is from a company called Farmhouse Tack out of South Carolina. Now, they are aimed at horseback riders and they are a small business, um, you know, really small team, really um, very direct to consumer business, but they are extremely knowledgeable about their community. And what they do is not only try to capture what kind of rider you are, right? Because a hobby rider is different from a sports rider is different from a parent who's purchasing for a child who's, you know, probably going to take it for a couple of years. Your budgets are different. Your needs are different. The kind of products and brands you're going to look at are different, but also just the depth of knowledge that you may have is going to be different, right? They capture that up front so that they can make sure that they're providing the right resources for those different audiences. Now, again, that doesn't have to be particularly complicated. Even a small business can be tagging this, whether it's in their point of sales service, their POS system, or within their database to say, these are the different kinds of things that we know matter to this customer. Now, some of this is, of course, segmentation, right? We've been doing segmentation for a while. How we take this to personalization is, again, taking it to the next level. How do we create a deeper profile of our, our customers and then get more specific about the way we offer them specific messaging and resources that are helpful to them? Farmhouse Tech is creating certain content for that hobby writer. For instance, you know, what are the top five essentials that you might need for your child who's taking lessons, right? They're com creating a completely different set of resources for their sports riders who are really serious. They're talking about how to nurture certain kinds of injuries in your horses, very different level of expertise in the content. But then they have to make sure that that's being delivered to the right customers in the right places, because otherwise it's not helpful to anybody. But by doing that, by sending it to the right person, they are then able to be seen as an expert in the space, a trusted resource. And it makes the people more likely not only to purchase themselves, right, but to refer the company as a resource for other people within their particular circle. So I think, um, is there an opportunity for every small business to do this? Yes, it takes discipline, it takes that forethought. And I think that's really what I'm hoping that the book gives people a resource around is building a strategy around really putting that forethought into the way we collect data, and we append data, so that we can make better marketing content and resources and messaging and deliver that to the right people. It's interesting you say that because it's really a new way of allocating the budget, really, uh, and looking at it. And so like usually when I talk to people, you can go from two to three percent of your revenue you spend on marketing. If you're into a more of a B2C, it's a higher percentage, right? But like, how do you convince them and you're, you're very convincing right now showing these personal stories, but someone that's like a uh, CEO thinking about the budget, thinking about how they have to change things. Like you've got the whole thing about content marketing. You have to go out there. There's all these extra pressures that we didn't have like five or seven years ago, which now is so much impacting our reputation and our brand, like things we didn't have to think about. A mom and pop didn't have to think about Instagram few years ago. Sure. Now they have to think about all these things and these experiences. So like if you're thinking of a small business to allocate the budget and thinking about the department, how would you how would you advise them in this? Or is it I more just a strategy of time, right? Of course, it's a strategy of time, but I think you're exactly right that you have to think about what's the return on investment, right? And I have a whole section in the book that talks a little bit about how ultimately how you make the business case for this kind of work is about return on investment. If you have a really strong data set, the things that you can do are a identify your best audiences because we want to nurture more of those people. We can improve the customer lifetime length 
right? So the engagement with our customers and we can increase the amount that they spend with us, right? So by impacting these different elements of the customer lifetime value, we can improve our business practices overall. But if you have none of these metrics, then you're not able to make the decisions on who is that top level audience that you need to be nurturing and creating more of. So I think ultimately, to me, this is an exercise in making sure you know who are the audiences you should spend the time on. Because my recommendation to a small business or to any business is the majority of your your business is going to come from a smaller percentage of your audience, right? The Pareto principle, right? 80% of your business comes from 20% of your people or something like that, right? If that's the case, like let's figure out who that right 20% of people are and put our resources against giving them the best experience and helping them spend more with us, become a better re- resource for us for referrals and also to spend for longer with us. So um, ultimately, I think that this is not only a data-driven strategy from a, a marketing experience perspective, but it's also a data-driven strategy from a, a business decision making point of view and i think that's really important as well so do you think um are you basically competing with sales then in all of this the re- client retention or is it more trying to integrate everything to work together and really because i think marketers understand better the psychographics of a, of a customer I think that's a great question. Ultimately, I think that this is really a more integrated approach, right? If you have a data-driven personalization strategy, then your sales team is also benefiting from that because the the pipeline is stronger. They're not just getting marketing qualified leads, but hopefully they're getting better sales qualified leads. And then once somebody is in your uh, you know business uh, community, right, you are then able to nurture them for longer and get better referrals out of them. So hopefully business leaders see that this is um, coming, of course, from my experience, 20 years as a, as a marketer who's worked with a lot of different kinds of top brands in building their strategies. But also, we've worked with so many different teams where marketing and sales alignment is a key component. These are the principles that will actually help sales get better results from the work that they are doing as well. You know, I love the example you shared, Torin, before of, you know, even getting a phone call from somebody, if they had been better empowered, not only with more information about you up front, but also could identify who are the people that they should be spending their time making the phone calls to, wouldn't that be a better, be a better experience for sales? Yeah. And it's interesting you say that because I have someone I, I know here that's a real estate agent that basically says I'm making the thousand calls because I can get this one thousand, this one person. But what you're really saying is, and what my, my mentors keep saying is go back to the clients you've already had and maximize them because they've already bought from you. And that's kind Absolutely. of what you're Absolutely. And I think it's also about identifying what's unique about those customers who have bought from you before that make them more valuable. The example that I share in the book is from um, Charles Duhigg uh, of the New York Times Magazine wrote this fascinating piece where he explores how Target in about 2002, their marketing team recognized that they needed to win Uh, pregnant women earlier in the cycle before that they had brand loyalties. And in order to do that, they needed to know who was pregnant before the competition. And to do that, most of the competition, most uh, women who have ever had children might know that you sign up for a lot of different kinds of free products. That's how people get that data about you, right? Target had to figure out how do we actually find this information out before the person has made this announcement or signed up for any lists. And so they spent six months with their data and insights team by hand running many, many, many different studies to figure out what is the information that signals that somebody's lifestyle has changed. And they did eventually figure it out. It took them six months of their team of 20 or so um, data analysts um, trying many different things. And then they figured out a pattern that represented um, somebody who's likely pregnant. They started they switched suddenly to unscented products. They stopped buying certain things. They started buying certain things, right? It gave them kind of a picture of, okay, this is a person whose lifestyle has definitely changed. It's probably a signal. Nowadays, with 
uh, the advent of AI and the ability to analyze so many of these things quickly, we could do this process in just a couple of queries. Imagine that you had your uh, robust um, data lake or, or uh, data mart um, attached to an AI query tool where you could say to it, identify for us all of our customers who have been pregnant in the last year. Back this out nine months from their actual um, or excuse me, um, six months from their actual delivery date. So, so when they're about three months pregnant, tell us at that time, what were they purchasing? Build us a profile of that person, run us a segment of those people moving forward. You know, in three, four queries, you can build this exact kind of profile. And so I think that our opportunity is to say, how do we identify those best customers and build more opportunities to reach those people and people like them at the appropriate time so that we can win against the competition. If we took that kind of approach, more of us would not only be getting more out of those best customers, but our customers would actually be more satisfied because we're delivering them those relevant messages at the right times. Wow, that's uh, that's really interesting what you're saying because it's, it's really important. Uh, and how does one get started with all of that? Like, so, uh, is it more taking on that you've done the psychographics and you're moving on to the next step? Are there any, like, so I'm thinking more now, right, for the small entrepreneur, the small business owner, uh, which is majority of business in the U.S., how would they take it on? Because they're saying they don't have time for it, right? And sure. so there becomes this competition of time, competition of just getting the sales in right now, feeling the desperation of scarcity. Uh, everything's looming. You got to pay staff, right? So you're like in this, in this, in this mess in a way. And then, yes, I'd like to have order in this. Uh, are there any like, data services that you feel have been very valuable or is it really not the data service? It's more the practice of the person itself or is it both? Um, great questions. Let's start with the small business piece of it because I think that's an excellent point. You're right. The vast majority of businesses um, are small businesses. One thing that I actually suggest in the book is how do we leverage some of these tools that are now available to us as a starting point? So I have a whole chapter about what do you do if you don't have any data? Now, of course, there are lots of different services where you can purchase certain kinds of psychographic data, even um, community-oriented data. So the psychographics really specific to certain uh, zip codes, for instance. But right now, because we have this access to AI and we're in this emergent time period where we're actually able to use large language models as a starting point, one of the things that I recommend that people spend some time doing is to build some different personas, hypotheses in their large language models or chat GBT type tools, right? Identify who are the audiences that matter to you, figure out what are the things that are the main motivators for them and use that as your starting point. Now we know with the hypothesis, you've got to test it, right? This is your assumption. Let's see if it's correct or not correct. But if you've got the hypotheses, you can start building some content for those audiences or some messaging for those audiences and then put it out to your customers. Let them choose, right? So to my earlier point about emails, email marketing is a really great vehicle for um, your small businesses. And it could be as simple as putting out messages to your audience where you say, you know, choose Choose your own adventure. Which profile sounds the most like you? Are you somebody who really cares about A, B, or C? Um, in the book, I share another small business uh, example, which is a company called Methodical Coffee. Now, Methodical Coffee both has cafes and also sells beans direct to consumer. They did research, so they didn't use a chat GPT. They actually did research, survey research on their audience, but they um, figured out what were the kinds of different profiles of their coffee buyers. There are people who are, you know, really hardcore coffee fanatics. They really care about the roast and the bean and the origin. They want to buy single origins. They want to buy weird stuff. That's what they're passionate about. There's a wide swath of people who consider themselves, I like a good coffee, but I'm not super picky. I want something that's kind of simple, um, something, let's call them safe, right? And then you have some people who are kind of way at the other end of the scale where they want something very light. They may only drink coffee occasionally or as gifts. So their needs are completely different, right? 
they kind of figured that out from the survey research. Again, they had these hypotheses, but they built um, language of marketing around these different products that represented these different audiences. And they said, pick the path that is most like you. And they found that because the language really reflected the motivations of the different audience segments, people were really a- easily able to say, you know what, I'm I'm the kind of safe, love a good coffee, not crazy, you know, or I'm I'm a, really a coffee head. And they, they came up with some lovely terminology for each segment, but it was very easy for their audience to identify themselves right away and buy from the right segment for them. And so that was a part of their strategic approach of marketing to actually get more from those audiences. Again, each different small business can start with those hypotheses, put those assets and marketing resources and marketing messages in front of their audiences and see where does it drive people. By implementing that system, they were able to raise their sales because they found that once people were kind of easily able to identify what's going to be the right coffee for me, even though I haven't tasted it because I'm ordering it online, it made their sales much simpler, right? Because people could kind of self-select their journey. We've done this from a larger business perspective. Um, One of our clients at Convince and Convert um, was the uh, University of Texas uh, Alumni Association, which is known as Texas Texas. They are the largest alumni association in the U.S. And we also worked with them on attitudinal research. So we went out there. We actually spoke to, you know, thousands of people who are um, alumni and identify what were the attitudinal similarities and differences between the audiences. And again, we segmented their audience, I believe, into about three segments. And they were driven by different things. Again, there were some people who they were really here for the legacy of the organization. There were other people who were really here for camaraderie and connection. There were was another group that was there more for a personal benefit perspective. And, you know, what can the university do for me? And what we found was that those segments, while they skewed a little bit by age, they actually spanned the generations. And this was a very important insight because for them as an organization, they had been marketing to new graduates, people who were 10 years out, people who were 10 plus years out, and they were really thinking about it by life stage. And what we found in the research was that didn't motivate their audiences. Mm. By identifying those attitudinal segments, we were then able to, again, change the way we do the marketing messaging. And again, as you hear that, you can probably say to yourself, oh, I can recognize which segment I might fall into if they were messaging to me. That's the point, right? Ultimately, this is not hidden information. It actually is beneficial to your customers. If you say to them, who are you amongst these groups? Of course, you're going to have some outliers for whom none of the messages resonate, but they're probably not your core constituents anyway. Identify who are the core constituents who need that communication. Let them self-identify. That's part of that data collection, right? And then refine by making sure that you're, you're putting more hypotheses in front of them. We believe that people who are really driven by legacy, these kinds of things matter to them. Okay, we we A-B test it. We see what resonates, what doesn't. Keep trying things, and then we keep refining in that direction. This is ultimately an ongoing practice, right? It's a little bit like exercise. I'm not going to give you a quick fix for your data and insights challenge. I'm going to give you a pathway to start getting good at building this practice within your own organization. And I think that's what's really key. It's a practice that needs to be implemented that businesses did not really have to think about more. But now really where the gold is, is maximizing the clients that you have. And what I think is interesting coming kind of to a close, but really want to take time to reflect on it is your viewpoint on AI. Um, How does that how does that fit in and how do you feel about it? as the technology itself if for the marketers. Absolutely. I think that AI is going to really change the game in the next couple of years in terms of making the analysis of data more accessible to more people. Now, that does not replace data scientists. You will need people who are helping you to structure the data well to get the most out of the data. I have a whole section in the book that talks a little bit about the importance of data hygiene and um, just building a really strong set of data and connections. But I think that AI will help you to empower your team to be more curious. Like I mentioned in my small business example before, if you built Let's say you built three personas. I've actually done this recently for a small business client. We built three personas within ChatGPT that we can now query against. We can test our messaging against those personas as a first line 
based on our hypotheses to refine those messages and then put them out to market. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, let's say I have um, a persona that is really driven by um, efficiency. It's really important for this person to get the most benefit from um, an efficiency standpoint within the organization. Now, we might write a blog post for this audience and I can put it into a tool like ChatGPT and say, you know, critique this this blog post, tell me what we should add more of and more and less of in order to make this blog post more relevant to this persona. It can be a partner in helping you to refine. Now, do I think that it's going to be the fount of all of our uh, content? No, hopefully not, because I think that the human expertise is extremely important. But I do think it can be a partner in not only ideating around your different audiences, but also refining for those different audiences so that you save time in your process and go further. Now, that's not to say that there are not important safeguards that need to be considered. In the book, I also talk a little bit about, you know, again, ethics and privacy and balancing data and privacy. But, you know, we did custom research specifically for the book. And one of the things that we found was that while there is a desire for both personalization and privacy, the number of people who actually are more interested in the benefits of personalization is higher than the number of people who emphasize um, uh, just more privacy. So what I mean by that is 44% of people said that they would prefer more personalization and more customization and more of those messages that are highly relevant to them. About 25% of people said they would prefer um, kind of a balance. And then 31% said that they really felt that privacy was more important to them. So again, you have to see that the majority of people fall between balance and um, the benefits of personalization. So what that indicates to me is that the greater public is, um, let's say, informed of the opportunities to get a better experience for themselves. And therefore, they are willing to sacrifice a little bit of that privacy in order to get there. I think transparency is really important. I think communicating to your audience about where and how you use that data is really important. And, you know, to, to our earlier point about GDPR, et cetera, making sure that that's highly relevant data that you're collecting within the environment, that's important. But ultimately, I think that we can all benefit from a more data-driven and more personalized approach. It's really about um, deep listening, I think. And I think that's where when you're creating the whole app, you're doing it as almost like a charity. It's an extra thing that you get that has nothing to do with the price point. And the more you can give those extras, you feel more taken care of. So it's really it's really a good practice, I would say. And then the people that Absolutely. don't want to be a part of the app, they just opt out. They're, they've kept taking care of their privacy. Yeah, it's a, that's it exactly seems right. To be, it seems to be quite logical. Oh, that's interesting. How did, You launched the book first in the UK, right? Yes, that's correct. My uh, publisher is UK Beds, so the book came out. Uh, I'll show it for you. Um, yes, you got to show it. Yes. Um, it beautiful. came out first on May 3rd in the UK, May 28th in the US, but now it's uh, available globally. I've had yeah. um, you know folks buy it in Spain and France, etc. So it's great to see that folks are picking it up and I'm really excited to hear the early feedback and I've gotten wonderful yeah. questions. So it's been wonderful. Ah, I look forward to I, I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, so if you what are you doing next with the book? So you're going on tour then or what are you? Are you going to be Great. anywhere or how That's do people great. get to find you? And <laughs> yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Yes. So of course the book is available everywhere that books are sold. Um, and uh, if you purchase it from the publisher, coganpage.com and you're in the U S and UK, you can actually get free shipping. So that's uh, wonderful. Um, the, uh, book is also going to be available at a wide variety of events. I am speaking across the U.S. and globally um, uh, throughout the rest of the year, so folks can definitely find me in, at lots of events, including Content Marketing World, Marketing Profs, uh, Together Digital. I'll be at Meltwater Summit in just a couple of weeks, so um, I'll be in lots of different places. And most exciting uh, of all, we have um, a companion podcast series, which is called Data Driven Decisions, which is available on the Convince and Convert website. Um, our, webs 
our episodes have just started dropping uh, in June. And so uh, I have some wonderful interviews with some folks who are featured in the book, um, but also many new guests as well. We have guests from Salesforce, IBM, um, Seki Sui House, uh, Optimizely, and many other companies talking about how data and insights uh, are impacting culture and strategy within their organizations. And what I think is really exciting about that is we really go beyond just the common applications that you might think about. For instance, with Seki Sweet House, I uh, interviewed um, Aaron Willis, who is their um, chief marketing and insights officer, and they are doing some fascinating stuff in terms of ethnographic studies where they're understanding how people actually live in their houses. Um, they're one of the uh, top five um, builders um, in the U.S. They own many different brands in the U.S. And so um, they're actually learning how do people live in their houses and therefore how does that impact the way we market and develop products for those people, right? Are people spending more time together? Are they spending more time in the kitchen? Do people now need a media room? Do people need a man cave? What are the things that actually matter to people? And I think that's a, a wonderful example of really deep insights that are being surfaced by various brands. So that's great. So where we can find you, we'll put that in the show notes. Well, definitely the podcast sounds fantastic. And where you're going to be speaking around the world, um, people can come and hear you, hear you talk about this very important issue. It's, it's very important. It's like one of the groundbreaking, I think, it's the new mindset that we all need to kind of bring into ourselves and our business. So it's very helpful. So as a last question is, if you're going to think about your life at the end, what would you want to become known for? Torn, I love this question because I think that <laughs> as you get older, your priorities yes. change. And I feel like as much as I love my work, I love teaching, I love being a consultant, I love writing books like this. I think that ultimately at, at the end of my life, I would want to be known as somebody who is kind and has helped other people and has been there for other people. And it's really as simple as that, because ultimately, I think that that's why I'm passionate about the work that I do, because I get to help people achieve their goals all the time. But when I think about it in the in the broader scheme of things, especially as a mother, just think of um, being someone who is giving to other people is, is important to me. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate it. Um, this has been very a learning experience, really shifting the mindset. We do need to invest more time in our clients and this is a really good way to do it is really listening at a whole different level so thank you thanks Taryn. thank you for listening to become famous podcast if you like what you heard please subscribe rate and review our show your support helps us keeping bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry keep shining and see you next time